open up the conversation with another question to specify what we're talking about. And I'd like to open up it up to the floor, back to everybody. What other practices are connected to your own faith that you experience in your own life? Um, I would like to add that um, I think, uh, you know, daily prayer for, um, for, for our religion is um, common, expected, prayers beginning of the day, end of day, um, prayers before meals, um, going to Mass um, to receive the body and blood of Christ um, every Sunday, Sunday's day of rest. It, it means that um, there should, you know, the, 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 um, philosophy, the reason is for a day of rest from, um, and spend time with family, no shopping chores. Um, and, um, it's, it's a holy day. Um, and mm, I think, you know, there are other um, saying the rosary, um, stations of the cross and the stations of the cross in church, uh, in, inside of a church represent, um, Jesus and Jesus is, uh, you know, dying on the cross, um, so that we all could be saved. And I think, um, that gives a, some, uh, overview and, um, examples and I'll pass it on. Uh, the practices which are central to the name of God in our religion, that is the Sikh faith, is firstly that uh, we have a faith which is of action. It is not that just we sit down and we've got to pray. It is a life of action where we have a certain set of rules which are not that if we don't do it, we are going to be punished by God. It is out of love that we do it. And those are our daily practice of saying our prayers, which are in the morning, and particularly doing simran. That is the continuous chanting of the name of God, but it is with awareness, with the consciousness that he is there. So that's Simran. Then we have our prayers in the morning. We have prayers at dusk time, that is before, say, dinner in the evening, and that night before going to bed. Now, these uh, Banis, or as compositions we call it, they have a beautiful meaning to them. And the first one, which is Japji, and that starts with the Mool Mantra. That's the root of our uh, Banis of Guru Granth Sahib Ji. And that the whole of uh, the explanation of Guru Granth Sahib Ji explains. It's a very beautiful one, and it starts with Ik Onkar. Ik Onkar means, is a simple thing, explained, very small, but it is just one God. And secondly, Onkar, he is present in his creation. And then there are the attributes of that, uh, you know, his uh, uh, attributes to his character or to his personality, we can say. That that one God that we believe in, which is present in the creation, he is present, he is in the form, and he is the doer. He's created it, he is a doer, and yet he's separate to it. So if something happens to the universe, he's still going to be there. He was always there, he is there, and he will always be there. So in that case, it is his truth. And in our faith, we believe that truthful living is even higher than the truth. So you have to actually embody that type of living in your daily life. Then this God that we believe in, it is Karta Puruk. He's the creator and the doer, as I said. He has got no fear. He has got no enemy. And he's timeless. He is self-existent. Nobody I mean, nobody, he's not, uh, he's unborn. He doesn't have a mother, father, anybody. He's self-existent. And that we can achieve to realize him by is his grace. So it's not that can, I can do that. That veil of duality is lifted. And to realize that presence of his is by God's grace. And besides that, the most important, another, we also call it Nam, another practice, a very, I mean, concept of the name is Simran and Seva. Simran is, one is the formal way that you sit down and do it. The second way of Simran is also Seva, that is service. That we, when we serve, I mean, serve the humanity, his creation, that is Simran for us. That is, we do Seva for somebody is not out of, you know, what fruit I will get or what is the reward. 
it is selfless it is without any consideration of getting any reward but just because it is out of love and that love is because i feel the presence of god in me and in the other person of course service for the poor for the needy for the others is always there and this practice we do it you know every sunday like here in sunday in america but in india where i grew up we have a daily uh, practice where we go and worship god in the gurdwara and there the worship is not by sermons it is by singing with the sound of music and the words we sing his praises and after that we have a community uh, you know meal that you can say which is called langar and that langar that is done it is prepared by all of us again is selfless the cleaning the cooking the washing and serving it to the needy people it is done it may be needy or not needy whoever comes to even your house or to the place of worship that langar those meals are served so that again is we call seva that is one form the other <laughs> seva can be you know even giving knowledge of the divine one of the god that's another seva then financially you can help anybody that seva but the most important seva that we think is remembering him because once you remember him once the most important thing is that ego when that ego is dissolved that i is dissolved then you see him in everybody and out of love you do service for him so it's a very active form of uh, the naam that we think because see, we think this is naam serving other people is naam doing service for the humanity loving them looking after the you know the poor the needy the sick whoever needs you then you place yourself without any reward that is your simran and seva so this is the most important practice that we have it's a practice it's a lifestyle and it's a daily way of living yes that's right that's every moment and we are supposed to remember him all the time at the back of the mind whether we are you know talking walking whatever we do we feel his presence and we remember him that is seva So in Judaism there's certainly some core practices that would be connected to you know bringing God to mind uh prayer is clearly the central one and within uh the structure of prayer the core phrase that we are meant to say when we wake up and when we go to bed is the declaration of God's oneness called the Shema you were talking before about the listening one so it's the same root Shema pay attention listen uh, adonai is uh, our god adonai is one um and that's the central affirmation uh our prayer services have a structure to them that evolved uh um it was really the second layer of evolution in Jewish tradition because if you look at the biblical sources uh, worship of god was through <coughs> sacrifice um and once the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in the roman era in 70 ad we uh we already had prayer practice but it evolved into being purely a prayer practice so there's a lot more detail that i would give but it would become very complex to talk about all of the different structures of prayer service um but one of the things i think with this question about names of god and ideas of god is uh, it, judaism doesn't really have one way of describing god i think we've heard that across our faiths um and i often engage with students the question uh thinking about if you have a particular idea or an idea that you feel um brings you some comfort or sustenance at a particular moment in your life if there's so many different ways to talk about god and god is infinite what difference does it make whether you think this way or think that way and what's interesting is that some of these ideas while each of them is incomplete and only partial it does make a difference to how you conduct yourself in the world so for example um the idea of us being partners in creation of or recognizing that we are a part of god um gives us an agency uh you talk about service and we talk about mitzvot uh ways of acting and behaving and connecting and serving others that um you can do that from a purely humanist point of view but you can also it has a power to it when you think about you're actually embodying god you're actually bringing some of that energy 
to positive, creative purpose in the world when you think about it as being an aspect of God. Um, so if you have a different idea of God, it would, where God is some transcendent separate being, you, you know, you would think about these questions and it might um, generate how you behave in the world in a slightly different way. Within Judaism, there's also mysticism. And with mysticism, again, I, I always find it fascinating that when we get to the mystical branches of our various faiths, we often find there we have the most in common um, because those are the most universal ideas and languages. So Jewish mysticism has all kinds of practices that work with um, taking the name of God, combining it with all of the different vowel sounds in the Hebrew alphabet in kind of mantra-like meditation practices because they really believe that the sounds of the universe, the sounds of the language, are like the DNA of the universe, that you know, God speaks, let there be light in the Bible, and there is light. So it's allegorical, it's thinking about how we, through language, how we are a creative force. Um, and so there are mystical practices that actually take that to a, a powerful place of thinking about how we are changing the energy of the universe through combining sounds, including the sounds of God's name. Uh, so that's another practice. We talked about praise, you know, when we say hallelujah, a lot of people know that word, hallelujah. It's, it's not one word, it's two separate words. Hallelu is praise, and Yah is an ancient name of God uh, in Hebrew. So praise God. Um, so we have many psalms and praises and songs, and uh, that's part of our liturgy as well. Um, so these are, these are some examples of the practice. Can you clarify when you bow, a lot of people bow down, and they, you know, just doing this, what are they chanting? Uh, with, when they do this. So uh, I think what you're referring to is um, that in some traditional forms of Jewish prayer, there is the idea of the body being in motion while praying. Now what they're saying are we have set liturgies that are printed in books um, and they evolved over a period of time and you know and, and they and they grew over time as well. So now now they're quite extensive. as I said, if I, went through all the details of the steps of that service, of what the liturgy says, we could be here for a long time. But the body motion is actually something, you see it more in uh, more traditional branches of Judaism, and it's, but it's the idea that we are praying with our whole bodies, that it's not a mind exercise. I think you talked about this. It's, it's about how you embody your faith and your belief. And so... No original, like one or two verbiage which they say over and over? Um, no, no, not usually. Unless you're in a, a context of, uh, there are Jewish circles that come together for chanting, yeah. where you might take a phrase in Hebrew and repeat it over and over again to a melody. So that's more like a mantra-like chant. Um, but that's a more contemporary, it, it has ancient roots in Judaism, but the way that I've experienced it has been actually primarily a Jewish form that has been influenced by, um, uh, Hinduism and Sufism as a practice. It's more common in those traditions, and we've just kind of taken a, a Jewish take on it, but it's it's not original to uh, to us. There are some pl places in prayer when we pray communally, even in my community, where we bend our knees, where we be bow at specific moments for specific words, um, and most commonly it's the word blessed. Blessed are you, God. So the word baruch, um, which means blessed, um, is connected, um, at least by sound, uh, to the word berech, which is the knee. Uh, and so the idea of bending the knee and bowing. Of course, in Judaism, historically, if we go back far enough, that bending was a full prostration. Um, and uh, uh, from what I understand, I don't know if this is historically correct, but it was taught to me that once the Muslims started to prostrate in their prayer, we stopped prostrating. Um, uh, you know, that at a time when people were more concerned about those distinctions. Uh, but that used to be a part of Jewish prayer in ancient times. Yeah, before I kind of talk about the practices, uh, I'll just kind of go back to kind of the names of God in Hinduism. So uh, at a conceptual level, at, a, at the highest spiritual level, uh, the name of God is basically Brahman, right? I mean, we call about Ishwar and so on, but... Typically, we start with Brahman or Parabrahman, uh, which is basically the formless form of uh, God, right? 
and uh, that there are three kind of attributes to that one is you know it's called sat chit ananda sat chit and ananda sat basically means the truth chit means its consciousness and ananda is its bliss so these are the three manifestations of the formless uh, you know representation of god and uh, one of the sounds you talked about the primordial sound right is om right um, even in sikhism you have this ekankar right so om is supposed to be very a primordial sound which kind of emanates and that's supposed supposed to be the sound of the universe actually that's what they kind of attributed to and uh, even om is actually composed of three components like there's an a u and a ma and a is supposed to originate from kind of the below the navel region and then u is kind of in the chest region and ma is basically in the head right so what it actually signifies is you know when you actually translate that parabrahman into a more persona form right it kind of maps into three kind of functions basically one is creation one is sustenance and one is basically destruction so the creative form is called brahma right uh, and the sustenance form is basically vishnu or narayana right and the third one is uh, destruction which is shiva or ishvara right so this so that you know to make it easier for the common man to kind of common person to kind of understand and grapple with the concepts so this kind of broken down to three parts basically three forces of nature fundamentally right and from that of course you know uh, i was telling simran earlier that you know from that all of lot of other tasks were kind of segmented and lot of other gods were spawned basically right you know ganesha for removing obstacles and saraswati for goddess of knowledge and there's a goddess for wealth so it's kind of a segmentation of different roles and responsibilities in the universe right and that's kind of the uh, uh, you know genesis for the multitude of gods that kind of come into uh, come into hinduism as such right so that's the names kind of evolved you know automatically on that front so how do we actually kind of you know, take care of these names as such right so one is as you can kind of said one is basically through chanting some some people just chant om 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 multitude multiple times which is kind of reaching out to the para brahman and if you take some of these forms like uh, brahma vishnu and uh, shiva we can chant those names also right so we say om namah shivaya if it's a shiva or om namo narayanaya i am om namo brahmaya right so for brahma itself right so and that is kind of you can do it either in a japa mode which is basically you know the chanting which is kind of you know it takes you into a deeper meditative state as you keep on chanting and people chant for thousand times hundred times or even 2000 times and so on and so forth that just to kind of quieten the mind ultimately you know i think you know we all kind of you know in all religions uh, at the end of the day we realize that you know prayer is not to please the gods he is he is already complete in himself right it's not to please him it's basically to cleanse our mind it's basically a, a kind of a mechanism to charge from the universe take charge from the universe right and cleanse ourselves and the longer you chant the quieter you get the mind is focused on one thing so it's basically moving from multitude of thoughts i mean our mind is like a wild horse right it's too many things running in the mind if you move from multitude of thoughts to one thought basically you know when you chant and then once you kind of submerge into one thought after some time you realize that you get into a zero thought situation which is basically a kind of you know you kind of merge with the you know the cosmic spirit and that's kind of the state we want to get into more often than not and so there is japa there is kind of this kind of chanting of names and there is also stotra right stotra basically means you uh, you praise the lord and one way of doing that is you take the na- take one entity for example vishnu and right and you create 108 names and you kind of describe vishnu in various forms because you right i mean over oh, the bearer of lotus the one who's sleeping on a snake so the kind of you know you create names of that sort and you have 108 names you have 1000 names also and that's basically extolling the virtues of each of those gods itself and that's called you know sahasranama or you know satanama stotra so that's another way of doing it and of course you know nowadays you know there's something called as kirtan which is basically singing the like even in sikhism you have this kirtan you just sing basically compositions on song and so on and that's another way of kind of extolling the virtues of god and uh, it is also said i mean uh, uh, in hindu uh, history basically right Uh, the timelines have been segmented into like you know four yugas as such right and now we are supposed to be in something called as kali yuga where you know there is a 
I mean, there's a Satya Yuga, Treta Yuga, Dvapar Yuga, and now Kali Yuga. Right? I'm sorry, I'm throwing a lot of technical terms here, but the idea here is, you know... That's good. I mean, good yeah. Learning. The idea here is, you know, in each of the Yugas, there is a... Uh, certain concepts are kind of you know, held high, right? For example, in Satya Yuga, truth was the ultimate, right? And Treta Yuga, again, you know, dharmic practices, you know, being righteous and all that stuff was very, very much there. In Dvapara Yuga, you saw that, you know, there's a, for lack of a better word, I'm going to say progressive degradation, right, over time of, you know, what is right and what is wrong, right? I mean, there's a kind of a bar where you have to say that, you know, anything above this is good and anything above below this is bad. You see that in the in the norm, in today's world, you see that you know that bar is going down. It's okay, it's okay, right? I mean, even if stealing once or twice is fine, right? You start compromising, so that you know you see that in Kali Yuga, it is said that you know there is a progressive degeneration of people's behaviors, and most of the wrong things tend to get accepted as right, right? And it is said that in this kind of a world, it is okay just to say the name name of God if you want enlightenment. So God Himself has kind of lowered the bar. For us to get enlightenment also. So that's why, you know, there is a lot of saints basically who kind of came up in this era, who kind of composed songs just to kind of, you know, be able to sing the name of God. And they said, just singing the name of God is enough. You don't have to do any penances or rigorous ritualistic practices. Just say the name of God, that's enough. Just, you know, twice a day, maybe once a day, whenever you can. So they made it so easy for us, right? So no stipulation, no no rules. Just say the name of the whenever you can, whatever, however you can. So they made it that easy right now. But even that is becoming difficult for us in this generation. So that's kind of practices, of course, you know, uh, uh, more by practice than stipulation, we kind of uh, say the name of God or chant some of these totras in the morning and then once in the evening, so twice a day pretty much. So that's kind of the way things have transitioned and things have progressed in, in the Hindu religion. For, for clarity on a question, one God or... I know you were saying God of wealth, or God yeah. of, are, is it one God, or multiple virtues of one God, or how in Hinduism is that? Yeah, so like, uh, it's it's ultimately one God, right? It's basically one Parabrahman, it starts with the formless, right? Mm-hmm. I think, you know, when people graduate to a level where they can understand the the metaphysics of it, right? I mean, they can, they'll come to accept that everything is formless, right? But the common man, I mean, as we, as we grow up in our cycle, right? I mean, we don't really automatically grab, it's like a PhD level, right? When you have a PhD, you understand the formless Brahman, right? right? But everybody, we're not always automatically born with a PhD, right? So we have to graduate through the various steps. And to facilitate that, right, the concepts are brought down to a level where you can kind of follow and grasp and latch on to those concepts as such, right? And in that spirit, right? and people have, I mean, just like, you know, you can't handle one phone, for example, right? You can't handle one model of car. We need div- Diversity is a need for the human mind. Human mind cannot handle, you know, uh, uh, you know monotony, right? And that's the kind of uh, thing which has been capitalized and kind of, you know, brought down. Because, you know, we have multitude of people so, and people have different tastes. And that's why this whole thing was broken down to kind of have people kind of uh, focus on one or two of their choice. For example, a lot of people say that, oh no, my favorite Lord God is Ganesha. And he says, no, because I worship Ganesha, a lot of good things happen to me. And that's their way. Some people worship the monkey God, Hanuman, right? And say that, no, that's my favorite God. Right? Because, you know, it's just that they endear to something close to them. And that's something that the religion does not want to deny. But ultimately, you know, they all channel back into the, you know, whichever you go, you go back to the final worship. In fact, there is one uh, shloka, as uh, Mm, uh, shloka basically means a, a verse which says, you know, Akashat patitam toyam yatha gachati sagaram sarvadeva namaskaraha keshavam prati gachati. The meaning of that is just like, you know, water which comes from the cloud, from the skies, ultimately through rivulets, through tributaries, it all eventually goes back into the ocean. Right? Right? Whichever name you kind of, you know, wherever it falls, whichever name of God you take, but under, understand that, you know, they all go and reach me, the Supreme God. Right, so that's the thing. So it's basically a channel to worship the, the guy behind, right? Mm-hmm. The guy behind is the supreme lord. Oh. Okay. So I have a question. When they, I mean, worship all these different gods, maybe Ganesha Ji, maybe Lakshmi, the others. Yeah. But then, how do they really get back to the original form? You know, they think they might, but you know, you miss the, the formless one, that one that is there. 
In that case, you know, <laughs> attached to this one. And these are, you know, they are, you know, like, they're not timeless, right? They have their life and they went. So the formless, how do they ultimately, if they put their attachment on that, when are they going to go attached to that uh, formless one, to that one? How, how do you do that? Correct. So that's, that's the graduation stage, right? So people, you know, see, first of all, you know, uh, normally we worship, when, when we say worship God, even the meaning of worship, right? In uh, the word puja, we use the word puja for worship, right? And the, the uh, you know, uh, exponentiation of that or exposition of that is basically uh, purne jayate iti puja. Purne jayate means one which comes out of fullness. So normally when we say prayer, people think that it's basically a, it's a barter, right? I'm going to pray to you ten times, okay, give me uh, you know, a job in somewhere, right? So it's always most of the most of the prayers that tend to be are more transactional in nature, right? And maybe that's something. I mean, if you look at there's a Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So typically, you know, there's this you know basic needs: food, protection, safety needs, then belongingness needs, and then self-actualization, self-realization, right? <coughs> People always start at the bottom. So I mean, it's okay. You worship Lakshmi, you worship Ganesha, you have to do well in your exams. You get past this, but once you get past the idea is you have to be able to graduate. And that's where, you know, Guru comes in, right? Guru Dwara. Guru, through, through, so when you kind of get to the next level of graduation, normally they say once a Guru comes into your life, a spiritual Guru, he is the one who will take you to the path of enlightenment. So to even realize that there is a goal of enlightenment is a step that people have to, will graduate to. And that's why we say there are multiple lifetimes it takes to get there. It's something that you cannot indoctrinate, not even in one lifetime. Right? It takes it takes a while, and people kind of graduate step by step, step by step. It's a long journey. So I think I think the question probably is that masses may not understand. Exactly. There is a there is there, like you are very educated, very well educated. No, no. Probably you know you have dwelled yourself into, but if the masses may get lost into, you know those stages, and that's where the concern comes into. Just like uh, you know. The, other participants were saying, connecting with the actual being, and all these are methods of connecting. Mm -hmm. You know, so the concern of the question comes into my mind, and I, I do understand that actually all religion, at the end of the day, understand Correct. and 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 talk about the Creator. Exactly. But could because most people may get lost uh, before they get to that point. So how do you preach and teach? Is there any methodology or any system where you are actually teaching your kids or next generations that, you know, it's the ultimate God you've got to get to. It's the PhD you've got to get to. Correct. So some... Sorry, to add to this, you could answer. Uh -huh. uh, it's not that everybody that does a PhD is that level. Yeah. So how do you go? I mean, how does one know how to arrive Correct. from this God of prayer? I've got to go to the next one. Correct. So, Everybody Correct. doesn't do PhD. You're, they may not even do master's. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. Where do we focus? Correct. Where do we get there? Ad, absolutely right. So that's why there is a there are different yogas, right? Um, yoga means it's basically a union, I mean, ways of union. One is Gnani Yoga, right? Gnani Yoga is what I said. I mean, you have to get into the PhD level. You you conceptually and you actually you know realize that you know you, you there's a it's a formless Brahman that you need to and you're part of that whole system, right? You're not separate from the divine. Right, that's a kind of conceptual understanding. Second thing is a karma yoga. Right, it says I mean you don't have to worry about anything else. You just work. You work and you offer everything to uh, to me. Right. So he says karma nevadikar ste maapale shukadachana. Right, which basically means you know you only have you can only do your duty. Don't worry about the result. Just offer it to me. Right, and that is another way. Very good question actually. Right. So you don't have to do a PhD. There are other ways to get to your graduation basically, right? One is through karma, one is through gnana, knowledge, one is through karma. Do your best and leave the rest to me, right? As, and at the end of the day, we also say Krishna Arpanamastu. When we say Krishna Arpanamastu, I say that okay, whatever I did, God, it's all yours. I'm just an instrument in your hands, right? It's, I, I don't carry the ego. It's not my thing. I did not do this. I dropped the ego, right? So once you drop the ego through action, you merge with me. Right? Merge me meaning I mean the, the divine, basically, right? And the other way is bhakti, right? Which is what I said in terms of kirtanas, stotras, and all that stuff, which is devotion, right? You just be devoted to me. In fact, devotion is supposed to be the highest 
form of uh, worship. The reason is, if you go with Gnana Yoga, which is knowledge based, you, you, there is a chunk of ego which travels with you. Oh yeah, I, I've got a PhD. right? So that ego sits, ego doesn't go. Whereas in, when you do bhakti, devotion, devotion automatically entails that the ego, surrender, ego drops basically and you surrender. So the concept of surrender which you also mentioned, right? So Once you surrender, Yeah, I know I'm going for a... I was going to say, so in, in Hinduism, there's a lot of different, you know, as, as you have many different gods, there's a lot of ways to be devotional, a lot of different ways Correct. that you can connect with God. It's, there's so many different aspects to connect with. Correct, correct. So, yeah, so, the, so through devotion is another way. So that's that kind of, you know, so even for the masses, right, it's not like the masses have to wait. For centuries, I'm saying centuries because the graduation path is such, right? But uh, yeah, because there's a lot of things. The ego has to go, and the ego going away is not a is an easy thing. It's well, not an easy thing, me. right? So, so yeah. uh, I think you put your finger on something though, which is I think at the crux. It's a very important question that many of us grapple with, and especially when we talk about teaching others, uh, you know, um, introducing youth to different ideas about uh, belief, that I certainly understand that developmentally, when I'm working with the youngest children in, you know, in my congregation who are concrete thinkers, right? we all have, we have Bible stories, mm -hmm. and God is anthropomorphized, right? and God intervenes and makes things happen in the way those stories are told. What happens, unfortunately, is some people um, stop their studies and stop thinking about mm -hmm. these ideas um, once they're at an age which could be, you know, it's happening younger, I mean, 9, 10, 11 years old, are ready for something more complex. And if we only provide these very concrete ideas, these limited labels, and um, then we often find in the modern world is that people either carry them with them and have a, a not very sophisticated concept of God that they carry with them, um, or they reject God altogether, and they don't realize that what they're rejecting is a human construction, what was meant to just be a representation on the path, as opposed to going deeper. And so I'm always finding myself grappling with how and when to try and engage with that you know, less concrete way of thinking. And I know that even with 10th graders that I study theology with, I'm surprised that when I show them a whole menu of different God ideas, from the most concrete to the most abstract, to Ein Sof in Jewish mysticism, which is the infinite without end, one in which it is the it is the Ein Sof is the, the God idea that is absolutely everything everywhere, and we are all a part of it. It is the most abstract, without end, without form, without time, without physical being. And I've heard many of you express this idea of God. Many of my students d do not feel drawn to that. It's they can't grasp it. It's you know they want to see it and feel it, and many of them still do like the idea of God as the King, who's in charge, who's you know rewarding good people and punishing bad people. But it's the world that they would like it to be, mm -hmm. not the world as it is. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes, um, you know, I have to ask, can we teach differently mm -hmm. to help people? get to a different place sooner, but also sometimes something has to happen in its time, like a life experience. <laughs> you know, when somebody has a life experience and the idea they had about how God was meant to work in the world, there's a cognitive dissonance, right? I've had something terrible before someone in my family or something in my life, you know, either, you know, it's, something here doesn't fit. And, you know, that kind of crisis can sometimes open the door to um, a new understanding of God. It can sometimes lead to the rejection of God. Uh, so it's, it's, it's complex. But I think that that's part of the picture.